Let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your majesty, for your grace and for your love, for your awesomeness and for your power, for your magnificence, for your benevolence, for your mercy and everlasting, for your peace that endures to all generations. We thank you for life eternal, Lord. We thank you for the fact that you just know that we even exist and that you care that we live in you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are. And Lord, I ask that you would hide me now under your shadow, Lord God. I ask that you would speak a word, a life-changing word for your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 How y'all doing today? I have to say it's a little bit intimidating being up here this week after last week's awesome message. It's unbelievable. Amen. Amen. Well, it was good, wasn't it? Yes. Amen. It was thick and rich. And this week, I uh, just want to be with you for just a little bit of time. A little bit of time. And I want to talk to you about uh, a topic um, just for the good of the neighborhood. You know, and so I want to start out as, as I often do. I can't help it. Y'all know who, how I do. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about it. So uh, the question that I have for you, um, if you would take out a mental piece of paper, get your mental pen out. <coughs> And for those of you who are who consider yourselves to be mind readers, please don't look at your neighbor's paper. <laughs> but I want I want you to 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 <clears throat> think about this question. Write this down on your mental mental uh, sheet of paper. What it, what is your income? What is your income? Okay. You got that however it done um, weekly, monthly, annually, whatever, however you decide you wanna wanna do it. What is your income? Okay, now that you've got that down, um, would you like for that number to be greater than it is? Amen. <laughs> okay, if you have a if you have a number that you would like for it to be, can you write that one down? And again, no peeking at your neighbor's paper, please. Please. Okay, you got that? All right. Now, a little bit more effort. It's still doable. What do you do with your current income? When you think about all the transactions, this... Take out your mental bank book or, you know, you can bring it up on your mental PC online if you don't jot it in a, in a piece of paper and, and peruse through what, what is it that you spend your income on? Okay. Y'all got that? All right, now. Since, if for everybody who said they would like for their, their number, their current number to be greater than what it is, you probably have some idea about some of the things that you would like to do with that increase. What are those things? Write that down. Okay. All right. Last question for right now. I'm sorry. Think about all the stuff that you have ever spent any any of your capital on, your funds. And think about whatever it is if you can get to one that would be fine. If you have more than one, that's fine too. 
But what of all the things you've ever purchased have, has brought you the most joy? Of everything that you've ever spent some money on, what has brought you the most reward? Okay, I said that was the last question. I got one more. <laughs> Just three letters. Why? Now, Tradition says, right, when I look at my, my, what I have, what I'm bringing in, what I, what I have access to right now, I always get to this point where, man, it's not enough. I would like more. That's, that's, that's typical. If you ask most people, most people say, yeah, I'd like to make more money. Some people are, are stronger in that statement than others. Some people say, you know, I would, but I'm, I'm all right. Some people say, man, I really need to. And you ask them, you ask people a lot of times what, what kinds of things they would do with the more. And you have a list, you know, new car, new house, a vacation, or 10. <laughs> Whatever the situation is, but then you start asking people things like, okay, of, of the stuff that you have, what is most meaningful to you? And it's never, let me pull back, don't use an absolute. It's more, more often than not, you don't get the answer, well, yeah, it's the house, or it's my new ride, or it's whatever this, situ whatever this thing is, you, you get things like, well, it's the pictures, or this, this thing that I got because, you know, we were all in this situation in my family and we decided that we were going to spend our money and get this thing and we've had so much enjoyment out of this thing. It's never the stuff that we think about first when we're asking what do we want to do with the increase. It's always the things that are most meaningful are the things that we can't live without but don't plan for. Don't spend time and effort really devoting our energy to. Because if you go back to you, you bring your sheet back out real quick, and you look at the stuff that you're spending your money on, the stuff that you're spending your time in, how much of that stuff is me stuff, how much of that stuff is we stuff, and how much of that stuff is you stuff? Turn in your Bibles to Luke 16. Because there's a, certain, there's a certain modus operandi that we are supposed to have just because, by virtue of the fact that we who call ourselves Christians are supposed to be living a life worthy of the call. We're supposed to be at, doing things in a certain manner. And here we have an example of what not to and what to do. What not to and what to do. So verse 16, I mean, chapter 16 in the book of Luke, starting at verse one, it says. And he also said to his disciples. Now, we have to understand that Jesus at this at this particular time in this area of Luke, he was preaching a lot and doing a lot of teaching. And if you if you back up a, a, a chapter or two, you will see that Jesus laid out three par parables, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost coin and the parable of the lost sheep. And in each one of those, he was highlighting the fact that, yes, there were things that we have here, but those things that are outside and lost are important and we should spend some effort. You go to the parable of the lost sheep. That's where he said. Won't you leave the 99 that you have in your corral, in your pen, that are all safe just for that one that's out there lost in the wilderness with the lions and the tigers and the bears? Oh, my. Well, won't you walk away from all of those sheep that you have right here just so that you can go and save that one? Is it not that important? Important enough for you 
to sacrifice your time, your effort, your energy, your blood, sweat, and tears to go out there and retrieve that one. The parable of the lost coin for the woman who lost, who had ten coins and she lost one in her house and tore the whole house up for that one so that she could receive back into the fold. Because this is all nice and it's all saved here, but there's those lost that are out there. The parable of the prodigal son who very defiantly said, give me my stuff so I can go. I don't want to wait until you're dead and somebody reads your will and somebody tells me here's what my share is. I want to experience all of that lavishness right now. Daddy, let me have my stuff so I can go. Okay, here you go. And, and, and we know the story, right? He goes out there and wastes all of this resource and he comes back when he realizes, you know what, I had a good thing. And I messed it up. And so he comes back and his father receives him with joy. And in every situation with, this, with the sheep, with the coin, and with the son, what happens on the back end is joy at the fact that there is an experience now. We are all together. We can share in this great abundance together. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were upset because Jesus was talking to tax collectors and he was talking to thieves and crooks and robbers and all of these people that he wasn't supposed to be associating with. You're not supposed to even be around those people, much less sit down and eat and enjoy some time with them. Why in the world would you do that? And here we see in chapter in chapter 16, verse one, after he teaches everybody about this lostness and this redemption, he turns to his disciples, those who have been walking with him, those who say that they are followers of Jesus. And he says there was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. If I put a pen there and I say, okay, you have this great resource. And you bring somebody in and you tell them, I'm going away on a trip. I need you to look after my stuff. And this message comes to you. And you say, and they say, you know, I don't know what it is that you were asking, but he is wasting all of your stuff. What's your situation? What do you do? What are your thoughts? The first thing you're thinking is somebody is getting fired, right? Well, that's exactly what happened. Because right here, in, in verse 2, it says, So he called, he being the master, called to the man and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be steward. You're done. I'm done with you. I know that I put you on contract, but you did not do what I asked you to do. So you're done. Pack your stuff. You're getting out. And then the steward says, oh, my goodness. What am I supposed to do now? He says right here, verse three, he says, I cannot dig at the end of verse three. And I'm ashamed to beg. My skills are conducive for what I was designed to do. I am supposed to be the steward, but I was messing up. So now I can't do that. What am I supposed to do? Verse five, it says, or verse four, it says, I have resolved what to do that when I am put out of the steward, out of stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. And he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said, all right, I know it's a hundred. Change that to 50 real quick. That's your new debt. He said to another, how much do you owe? 80 measure, uh, 100 measures of wheat. He said, okay, um, take that and change it to 80 real quick. And then something really strange happens, right? Because what would you have done if you, you had been hiring this person, you heard they were wasting your stuff, and then you came, came back 
And not only did you hear they were wasting your stuff, but you hear the fact that he's been out there reducing everybody's debt. It says it's the master's debt. And he just writing off debt left and right. What would you say? I'd be fired up. What in the world are you? Not only did you were you wasting stuff, now you're just giving stuff away? Not only are you just wasting stuff, but now you're just giving it away? But, but there's a, a, a nuance here, right? Because our, our vision is not God's vision. Our eyes are not God's eyes. What was it that the, the master wanted the steward to do from the beginning? Was take, that, that word steward is really management of his household. He manages the household. And anybody who knows, especially during this time, how was a house prosperous? A house prospered by its people, right? If, if, if you had, um, if you were considered to have great riches and great wealth, there were a lot of people and a lot of people to do a lot of things. So as people prospered, whoever the master of the house prospered. So what, happened, what is he doing in this situation? The steward is actually increasing the status of those within over and above his situation. Because when he started out, what was he thinking about? He was thinking about himself. And then he started thinking, you know what, my situation is, is finished. Their situation needs to be better than it is. Let me do what I can do to make their situation better. And maybe, just maybe, they will look after me if I need some help. Maybe, just maybe, if I extend myself for them, they'll extend themselves for me. I think it's very interesting that it says that the master commended him. And that word commended actually means praised him. Praised him because he dealt, it says right here in verse 8, dealt shrewdly. Now, we have to uh, 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 think about this because in, 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 our, in, in the natural, it just looks like he's stealing, doesn't it? On top of wasting, it looks like he's stealing. But if the master is not really concerned about this stuff, which by his response, we, we kind of get the sense that he's not then the, there must be a greater concern for the master than just the numbers on the paper, right? Because it says he commends him because he dealt shrewdly. It says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Now, we are called to be sons of light. But we are also told that we're supposed to be in the world, but what? Not of the world. Not of the world. It's that be in the world peace that gets us tripped up. Because we can't remove ourselves from the situation that we're in. We can rise above the situation that we're in, but we can't remove ourselves from that situation. Then in verse 9 it says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves. This is Jesus, again, speaking to the disciples, opening up great understanding to them for I say to you make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home go back to your mental sheet and you got your stuff the question what are you doing with your stuff how many friends have you made by that list Can somebody else besides you point to your list and say, my life was enriched or encouraged or blessed because of that list? Come on. 
when Jesus had risen from the dead and he was talking to Peter and, and, and he was telling Peter how Peter was supposed to live his life when Jesus left. And he asked Peter, do you love me? What did he what did Peter say? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> you know, I love you. And then what Jesus tell him to do. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Verse 10 says, he was faithful in what is least, is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least, is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Now, consider this. When, 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 when the, the Pharisees were trying to trip Jesus up and, and trap him uh, and get him arrested, and they asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said, what? Whose face is on this coin, right? And they said, well, it's Caesar's face. And then he told them what? Give Caesar what's his. Give to God what's God's. And right here, because that stuff, that's worldly stuff. All of this money and, and, and everything that we get wrapped up in, that's, that's, that's worldly stuff. He calls it unrighteous mammon. There's no salvation in a dollar bill. There's no salvation in a dollar No one is getting to heaven for excess or a lack of a dollar bill. No one, nowhere is getting any kind of salvation because of how much or how little money they have. Amen. Why do people get into heaven? From being obedient. Amen. From, 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 from identifying God as God, Jesus as Savior, and the Holy Spirit as Comforter. And when we do that, we start to look at this thing a little bit different. Maybe I do need some more income. Maybe I do need a little bit more research, resource. But not for me. Because I know there's somebody in my neighborhood right now who's struggling. And that's why Jesus tells his disciples, make friends for yourselves. By unrighteous men. Take that stuff that you have and use it. But use it for a godly purpose. Not for a worldly purpose. In our culture, here in the United States, our culture says, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Climb that corporate ladder. You need to look out for yourself because if you don't look out for you, then... And we buy into that. We create this, this, this corporate, we create this culture that is not community. We create this culture that is no good for the neighborhood. And really, honestly, all of the blessing that we have now. Uh, so I was having a discussion with somebody last week. I think it was in Bible study. And, and my question was, why is it that we have to get jobs? Why is it that we have to work? And I'm talking about our particular context. Because we got to eat, right? We need to eat. But let me ask this question. In this great country that we live in, is there enough resources to feed everybody? There's enough resources to feed everybody, but not everybody has food to eat. Is there enough resources to clothe everybody? There's enough resources to clothe everybody, but we still have people walking around in in great need of just basic things, <coughs> then what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? I mean, if there's enough there, why does anybody have to be, have to go without? 
You remember back in, in the beginning of, of the church in Acts when they all got together and it says they did what? They brought everything together. They threw it all in a pot and people took out what they needed. People who needed a lot got a lot. People who needed a little got a little bit. And everybody was satisfied. And, and here's, here's the beauty because it says, and numbers were added daily. They didn't wait for a Sunday to Sunday and say, you know what? Hey, let's, let's expand. Let's, let's grow. Let's uh, invite some more people. Let's expand this fellowship. Because they used the unrighteous mammon for the good of the neighborhood. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? For the good of the neighborhood. Am I willing to really be a neighbor? Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be? But really to get to a for good of, for the good of the neighborhood situation, there's three things we need to do. Number one, back in verse eight. It says they dealt shrewdly. He dealt shrewdly. He was commended because he dealt shrewdly. We have to become wise. That means dealing shrewdly means dealing wise, wisely. But it's not, it's not, it's, it's, it's navigating the end part of be in the world and not of the world. We, we, have, to, we have to actually be, a, be in this situation. We can't say... Well, you know, I've got my mansion over in glory. I'm just going to step out of the way of all this filth and nonsense here on this planet until God comes again. And I know I'm going to be taken care of. We have to develop some kind of street sense to figure out what it is it, what is it that we need to do. Answering that simple question, why is it that if there's enough money to put food on everybody's table every day in this country, why are people hungry? That's a simple question. With a pretty basic answer, we are some greedy folk. We are. We are. We, we are. Why does it cost more for medical care for people who don't have insurance than for people who do have insurance? The same, the same care. So we have to deal shrewdly. The second thing is what Jesus told his disciples, make friends. Uh, it's difficult for me to cheat my friend out of anything. Why? I have a connection with this individual. There's an expectation. There's an exchange going on. If I make friends with people, am I more likely to discount who they are, their needs, their wants, their desires? Aren't I more likely to consider them human and therefore a person on par with myself? I have to start viewing my neighbors as friends and not just people who had enough money to buy a home in the place that I bought my home. Do I even know who my neighbors are? I'm not just talking about where I live, but where I work, where I go to school, where I shop. I go to the store and I see the same people every day at the store. I know their face as soon as I see them, but I have no idea what their name is. I have to make friends with the stuff that God has given me. The income that I have is not for me to go out and buy the latest gator or whatever, or the latest. Yes. I can talk about gadgets. <laughs> I can talk about gadgets. 
It's not for me to always be thinking like the, the rich man who said, you know, my, my coffers, my, my silos are spilling over. I got so yeah. much stuff. What am I going to do with all this extra stuff? Here's a thought. <laughs> Instead of building another one to, to, to be an excess catcher, how about you do what God said in the law? Do you realize that there's supposed to be a Sabbath year? Do you know what happens in the Sabbath year? All debts are erased in the Sabbath year. Erased. Imagine that. Your credit card company coming to you and say, let's reboot. Yeah. Zero balance. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine your mortgage or your, your, your auto loan lender coming to you after seven years and saying, zero balance. <laughs> now think about this. That will free up a lot of resource for you, right? Is that first thought, man, I could upgrade. I could get a Bentley. <laughs> or is that first thought, man, I saw somebody walking down the street the other day and their, the soles of their shoes were flapping. Now, all of us don't necessarily have the ability to write off debt. Because some of us are debt tees, not debt tours. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But all of us have the ability to enrich somebody's life. And we do have this exchange that with friends should amount to. Do you realize there's a year of Jubilee? Yes. Which was every seventh Sabbath year. And in the year of Jubilee, what happened was not only were debts erased, but there was, remember when Israelites went into uh, the promised land, the land was divided up. And over the course of time, you know, people would go fall into debt or to others and certain things would happen. But on a year of Jubilee, everybody went back to, boom, starting point. This was land of your, your forefathers. This was the heritage. This is given back to you. Can you imagine that kind of thing happening. Oh, also on the Sabbath year, nobody's supposed to be working. <laughs> so this past Thanksgiving, Black Friday, what happened? People opened up on Thanksgiving evening. Yes. It was like 10 p.m. Oh, the sale? Yeah, it started. 10 p.m. <laughs> opening on Thanksgiving. Which for all, up until just these past couple of years, had been what? A no-no. Yes. Safe hospitals and police departments. Why? Because we are some greedy folk. We use that unrighteous man for unrighteous living. <laughs> Instead of doing what Jesus said, use your unrighteous mammon for the good of the neighborhood. And the last thing, so deal shrewdly, make friends, and be faithful. It's not your stuff. Your name is on that check. I know you don't get checks. It's probably direct deposited, whatever. But, but it's, it's coming to you. But really, whose wealth is it? Jesus said, um, that it was Caesar's name on that, but but who decided Caesar's name was okay to be on that coin? Everything points back to whatever it is that God is allowing to happen in the earth is happening. If God doesn't allow it, it doesn't happen. And guess what? Jesus said uh, in Matthew, the sixth chapter, that you should seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Don't worry about this stuff. He said, the lilies of the field, beautiful, aren't they? They don't plant. They don't grow. They don't, the birds in the air. When's the last time you see, saw a bird pulling into a bank worried about his 401k? Hallelujah. And Jesus said, if I take care of them like that, and you 
You mean so much more to me than the birds of the air or the lilies in the field. Won't I take care of you too? Be faithful. Because when you're faithful in the little things, he can make you ruler over many. If you're not faithful in the little stuff, I can't give you anything. One of the problems that Jesus had in his hometown when he went there is he was not able to perform miracles. And why was he not able to perform miracles? Because of their unfaithfulness. They, they had no faith that what, who he was, he was. And what he said he would do, he will do. Be faithful. And God will blow your mind. Come on. Come on. Amen. In Malachi, he said, try me. Try me. Try me. And see, won't he pour out, open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. People are often worried about giving up stuff. And Peter said to, to Jesus when he was talking about this exchange after, you know, the rich, he had told this rich man, hey, come and follow me. It was like, I've got a lot of stuff. And he went off sad. And, 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 and Jesus was saying that it was harder for a, a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And <clears throat> Peter was saying, we, well, we gave up everything to follow you. What will we have? And Jesus was talking about all the stuff that they were going to get over in glory. But he said, in this life and the next. I'm worried about the dollar bill that I have in my hand. And God's trying to put more in my hand. But if I hold on to this, I can't do this to receive what he has. Verse 13, and I'm going to get out of here. It says, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and men. If God is who you're serving, then guess what? He's going to take care of you. And the man will take care of himself. Because he owns the cattle on the you don't have to worry about what's tomorrow going to bring how am I going to eat how am I going to get this taken care of if you're doing what God wants you to do he's going to take care of you now he's going to take care of you how he wants to but he knows your wants and your needs and God wants you to be fulfilled so some of you may know and, and this is just a highlight, and then I'm going to close on this. Y'all remember just last week, week before last week, week before that, whatever it was. Everybody was going crazy. Because there was this opportunity that had presented itself. Right? Y'all remember what it was? Yeah. Y'all remember how much it was? $656 million. That's a lot of money. $656 million. And all you had to spend to win it was one dollar. One dollar. One dollar for the chance to win six hundred and fifty-six million dollars. And there were a whole lot of people running for the chance. You may or may not know this, but in the last hours leading up to the drawing. Tickets were being sold at the rate of $20 million per hour. $20 million per hour. The odds of you winning, and how many winners were there? Three. It was a billion dollars spent on tickets. One billion dollars spent on tickets. Three people won. Three. One billion dollars, three people won. The odds of you winning, you were 20 times more likely to get struck by lightning <laughs> than you were 
of winning that lottery. Now here's the thing. Has, has anybody in here ever been struck by lightning? Anybody? Does anybody in here know anybody that's been struck by lightning? One, two, three, four. Four people. How many people do we know that have been struck by lightning of the four? How many? One person? One person? One person? One person? How many people do we know? <laughs> Out of all the years that we have in this room, which amounts to at least, you know, 50, here, combined amongst all of us. Out of all the years that we have, all the people that we've experienced, I mean, you could probably rattle off a hundred people just off the top of your head. And that's people you're probably still dealing with. But think about all the people that you have ever met. And we have four people. Nobody in here has been struck. Just four people. Somebody knows somebody who's been struck. Now think about this. We know people right now are in need in this community and all in this region. And one dollar combined amongst all of us could probably make a difference. Yet, we are more willing for a shot in the dark of dark chance of getting something that probably is going to mess our life up because we don't know how to deal with it that we are of making friends with our brothers and guess what if you have a friendship with somebody and you become a person of need what's more likely to happen i say to you make friends with the unrighteous mammon that you have. And when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. We have to get out of this mindset that if I don't do it, it won't get done. If I don't hold on to this, whatever it is that I have, then I'm gonna suffer. We need to be like the three Hebrew boys and say, if I perish, I perish. If God doesn't come to my rescue, that's fine. But guess what? I know he is able. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything that I could engineer. Anything that I can engineer. My life is not my own. My stuff should not be my own. My ways should not be my ways. And my living, if I do that, will not be in vain. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God. That you are calling us to rise above, to be in this world, but not of it.